So as a child, stories played a huge part of my life. I really loved listening to stories, and I loved participating when given the opportunity in storytelling. I had this amazing teacher as a child who really used storytelling to help unpack math, help us learn about English and visual arts. For instance, what we'd do is we'd listen to a story, and then she would challenge us to create a painting from the opening scene of the story that she shared. Really helped me in my development as, as an actor, and when I got into grade nine, I found an agent. I would audition for most of the things that came my way, and many of them were dark and had a real evil undertone. And that's where, in my later teen years, I really started to wrestle between what I knew that I should do and what I knew was good, but with these great opportunities that would advance my career, but they were sort of shady in terms of the value that they had for me as a Christian. When I was in my early 20s, I had the opportunity to audition for a big Hollywood film called Max Payne, and it was starring Mark Wahlberg and Mila Kunis. The role that I had was uh, the role of Owen Green. The role was very dark, though. On the day that we're doing the big scene and we finished the blocking, right before I was gonna hear action, the director came up to me and he said, you know what, just be demon-possessed. And at that time, the full magnitude of what he said didn't really hit me. Cameras were rolling, and I just, as an actor, interpreted that and played the scene as if I was being attacked by demons. Later on, when I saw the film, and when friends who saw the film talked to me about that scene, they really felt that the director accomplished his goal in trying to bring out something very dark and demonic. And so when I heard that, I realized, you know what? I haven't honored God. So that really was a turning point in my life where I realized I want to serve God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. And I might have to stop acting in order for God to really reveal that to me. And that's what God impressed on my heart was that I needed to stop acting so that he could teach me something new. I really just bore my soul to him. I really just opened up and I just prayed and asked God to really show me what he wanted me to do with my life. And in that time of prayer and reflection, he just impressed on my heart, Joel, I want you to love me more. And I want you to tell my story. And I want other people to talk about who I am and tell my story. So I work with youth and young adults and churches all across Canada through Love is Moving, which is an initiative of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. And we're really just trying to give young people the opportunity to share about how God is moving in and through them and their communities and, and their lives. Some of the ways that we help young adults and youth share God's love is by sharing stories, real stories, that are happening to them and happening in their communities and in their churches. And we have a magazine and we had a television series and we, sh we share videos. We point people to other resources as well and just try to give them creative opportunities to express what God is doing all around them. You know, my whole life, I've been so accustomed to being in the spotlight. And over the years, God has really impressed on me the importance of not being the center of attention, not being under the light and being excited about that, but being excited about pointing people to who the light is, who is Jesus Christ. You know, I've been on red carpets. I've worked with Hollywood celebrities and actors and great directors and really influential people. And being around them is great. And I'm thankful for those opportunities God allowed me to have. But when I can introduce people to the person of Jesus Christ, and for the first time, they learn about who Christ is, and they learn about the love that he has for them, 
I come alive. I get so excited. I get so filled with joy. And, um, you know, just even thinking about Jesus right now, it, it just brings up in me the greatest fulfillment just to talk about him and to make his story known. I'm Joel Gordon. I'm a child of God. I'm a father. I'm a husband, actor, coach. I'm a pastor. I'm a student. And most importantly, I'm a lover of Jesus. Well, good morning, Livestream Church family. What an incredible story we just heard from Jordan Go uh, Joel Gordon, sorry. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to just read it back a little bit later when you have time and watch that story. So, so encouraging. Well, my name is Christine Gerber, and I am one of the regional pastors serving both in Oakville and in Brampton. So a huge shout out to our Brampton Church family and friends. So excited that we can uh, be doing life together. Ah, wow. Through this amazing gift of technology, we have the opportunity to be connected, our home to your home and your home to each other's homes. And so wherever you find yourself this morning, whether it's at home in your living room, your dining room, whether you're in a hotel room, wherever you might find yourself this morning, please know that you are not alone. You are connected. We are connected to each other and together we are the Livestream Church family. So welcome to this space. We trust that it's a space where God will meet with you and you will meet with God in a very tangible way and that your life can be transformed in this space. So welcome to this space. It's also important to us that you have a real sense of belonging. And so uh, there are a few ways that uh, can help with that. And one is the chat, which I'm sure most of you are already familiar with. And the other is the Discord server. So uh, the address is right on your screen. And we encourage you to just engage with each other there and share what God's doing in your lives. Uh, this is a great way for us to continue to build community uh, using the technology that we have. So welcome again to this space. And yeah, I am really excited about being together this morning because uh, we are in our second week of our New Year's series called Resolution. And uh, last week and in the weeks to come, we'll all be hearing from different teachers, guest teachers uh, joining us and helping us on our journey. Today, Carmen will be uh, introducing and speaking with Peter Robelin. And Peter will continue to take us down the path that we began on last week. Uh, a journey to joy. Well, as I've been reflecting on joy, I have to say that last year I really struggled to experience a deep sense of joy. And that was in part because of some of the struggles that we have been, uh, had been uh, uh, going through as a church family. But as I've reflected further as the year came to a close, I've seen how God has been so faithful to us and how he has sustained us as a church, all of us as a church. And that has been in large part to the generosity of all of you and your giving. And so we want to say thank you. Thank you so much for that. And here we are now in a new year and we are anticipating, we're moving into this new year, anticipating all that God will do throughout 2023. And I'm excited about that. And we want to invite you to continue to give, continue to partner with us in what God is doing. And so uh, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash give. And maybe it's an, um, a new thing for you to establish a new rhythm of giving. Uh, this is part of our worship, part of our just joining with God in the exciting things that he has for us. And so we can do that together. So thank you again for giving. Well, friends, now we're getting to go into what is part of my most looked forward to time of our services together, and that is the musical worship. And I want to encourage us as we go into worship this morning, wherever you are, as I said before, wherever you are, whether it's your living room or whatever, um, to take a moment to pause and to just prepare our hearts to enter in freely into worship because worship 
is an opportunity for us to experience the fullness of God, an opportunity for us to um, uh, let the walls come down and allow God's spirit a freer access to our hearts and our minds. And God wants to meet us in this space. So I really encourage us right now to just take a moment and let's just take a collective deep breath in and just let go of everything that all the rush, anything else that's on your mind, and just sink into this place, getting ready to meet with the creator. The creator of the universe wants to meet with you. So let me pray as we go into worship. Father, we thank you that you would invite us into this most intimate space to be touched by your spirit this most intimate place to know you and to be known by you, where all the walls can let down and we can be our true selves. Father, we thank you for inviting us into this, into this rich place. And now we open up our hearts. Come Holy Spirit and help us to do that. If that's difficult for some of us, help us to open up our hearts and to enter into this space knowing that you are pursuing us relentlessly with goodness and mercy and kindness and that you always make a way for your children because that's just who you are. You are a good God and you always make a way. So we come now with expectant hearts and empty ourselves fully to you in worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. All right, four of you are here. That's amazing. Awesome. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, church. There you are. I'm so happy you are here this morning. I'm going to welcome you to stand with us this morning. And as you stand... I welcome you to be intentional about this time we have here today, to be intentional to know that God is here. And whatever it is that you are coming in with this morning, the good, the bad, the ugly, the distractions, the tiredness, the lack of coffee, to recognize that you are coming to a God who sees, who hears, who knows, and he embraces you this morning, wants to love on you, wants to speak to you, wants to move in your life. So let's sing together.
you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never let me hear you this morning even when I don't
Sing that one more time. Oh, Holy Spirit, oh, Holy Spirit. Come fly. Glory. To be. I was praying over what God wanted me to share this morning, and what I got was um, questions. Some questions to start off the new year, to get us thinking, to get us in touch with the Spirit and what He's trying to do. In a book called Forgotten God, Reversing Our Tragic Neglect of the Holy Spirit by Francis Chan, he says, I also believe that the Spirit is more obviously active in places where people are desperate for Him humbled before him and not distracted by their pursuit of wealth or comforts like we are. When was the last time you felt humbled by the Spirit? The last time that you felt desperate for him? When's the last time you remember being uncomfortable and actually needing him? He also says in his book, in the craziness of our world, it takes tremendous effort to find quiet it takes time to quiet your mind and heart before the Lord. It takes time, and that means intentional, intentionally prioritizing, setting aside space for God. Time to pray, time to worship, to center yourself around Him every day, not just today at church on Sunday or at your small group one night a week, but every day. I did spiritual direction for a while, and one of the things that I had to do to end every exercise was pray specifically to each person of the Trinity. So praying specifically to Jesus, specifically to the Spirit, and then specifically to God the Father. And I found that as I did that, it changed the way I prayed. It changed how I showed up in prayer, and it changed um, who I addressed when I was praying for something specific. And I feel like it helped me be more aware of the Spirit and finding him in my daily life and mundane tasks and doing laundry and driving in my car, I found myself praying. Because the Spirit is there waiting for us to invite him in, waiting for us to make time and make space. He wants to fill it and he will fill it. He will do amazing things in us and through us. So let's make space, not just right now, today, but let's give him our burdens and our successes and our comfort and let's allow ourselves to depend on him, to actually depend and fully rely on him. Not on ourselves, not on comfort, not in the things that bring us superficial peace, but actual peace from the spirit.
There are no formulas, no definitive how-tos for growth in the inner character of Jesus. Such growth is a way of relentless seeking, but there are many things we can do to place ourselves at the disposal of God. And if with all our hearts we truly seek him, we shall surely find him. Dallas Willard. Our world continues on faster and busier, and we are reminded that our souls were not created for the kind of speed to which we have grown accustomed. Thus, we are a people who are out of rhythm, a people with too much to do and not enough time to do it. Rich Theodas. As long as we remain enslaved to a culture of speed, superficiality, and distraction, we will not be the people God longs for us to be. Rich Theodos. I am convinced, however, that our constant activity is fruitless without first making that humble act of kneeling to pray. I am convinced that prayer is not only our greatest privilege, but also our greatest source of power. Pete Gregg. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Joel, chapter 2, verse 12 to 15. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. James, chapter 4, verse 8. Well, good morning. Good morning here in Oakville and across all of our locations. It's so good to be together this morning. I am so personally excited for what we're about to engage into. This is week two of our Resolution series. And as we uh, postured last week, always January is a time to just kind of set ourselves well with rhythms and intentions collectively as a community. And something that we really as leadership, as your pastors, as your teaching team have sensed as we step into this new year is to lean into something called solemn assembly. And so we are taking this month of January through this teaching series to talk about what it looks like to continually make space for what God would have to say to us as we intentionally lean into conversation and confession and time with him. And so uh, that's what we're doing. We're spending some time learning together the biblical principles of solemn assembly. And I'm not up here alone. In fact, I'm not even really teaching today, which is even more fun. This right here, I want to introduce to you. This is Peter Robelin. Uh, he is uh, with us today. And I want to introduce him to you. I'm really eager to share a little bit about who Peter is and what he's going to share with us. So we're going to say a few things about you. Peter comes to us as a seasoned pastor in the GTA, and he'll share a little bit about that. He currently is the president of the Cheris Foundation. And you hold many titles, pastor, president, but also husband, father, grandpa, which may be more important. So I'd love you, whatever you want to speak to, tell us a little bit about you, Peter. Yeah, so would it be weird if I just talked about our granddaughter? <laughs> no, it'd be very understandable. <laughs> so yeah, um, our little girl, uh, 10 months, and it feels like we're in a new season of life. It, it's just been wonderful uh, to welcome her into the world, and uh, she is our delight and our joy. Uh, and every moment we get to hang out with her is it's kind of healing. I don't know if you know if that, what that feels like, but it's actually healing uh, to um, spend time with her. Uh, yes, married, 44 years, two lovely daughters, both got married in COVID, uh, during the COVID years, and um, we're, we're doing well. The Cheris Foundation, uh, I've been with the Cheris Foundation uh, for 12 years, and we come alongside of Christian charities that are uh, based in Canada, but do work all around the world. So I, I have this amazing opportunity to hang out with gifted men and women who are doing incredible work all around the world, helping to see God's kingdom come. So, and then, yeah, I was a pastor for 30 years. 
you know, no big deal. And also, and this is the fun part for me, Peter was my very first boss when I stepped into ministry. So I have known Peter and his family for 15 years, and my first job as a youth pastor here in Oakville at another church, the guy who hired me called me sh about a week after he hired me and said, I'm actually moving on, and I'm not going to be your boss anymore. There's going to be this guy, Peter, that's going to be your boss. And I can tell you guys, never has there been a gift of grace from God than to be able to work alongside and be mentored by. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> the legacy of ministry. So it's sort of even just personally this full circle, circle moment to be up here with you. And for all of you, for the things you appreciate in me as your pastor, you can probably thank Peter. <laughs> and for the things that you're not thankful in me as your pastor, you can maybe thank Peter for them as well. So uh, we've asked Peter to come and share because part of your significant time in pastoral ministry was at another church here in town where you leaned into this idea of sacred assembly. And we want to learn from you in that uh, what that looked like for you, yeah. what your experience in that was. And so yeah. that's why Peter is with us today. So we're going to sort of jump right in. So Chartwell Baptist Church was the church where you pastored for many years. Yes. And I would love for you to just ask, why, like, why did Chartwell decide to call a sacred assembly? What was going on that led you to that decision? So before I get to that, just so that you know, there is a special place in my heart for this amazing woman uh, and delighted um, with all the grace and the blessing that the Lord has placed on you and in this position here with the Meeting House. So you guys are like really blessed. <laughs> so <clears throat> Charwell Baptist Church, you know, by, by all kind of standard metrics, we were doing pretty well. Uh, our, our church was full. Uh, we were in the early stages of embarking on a multi-site church growth strategy and that was going well. And we were meeting budget, and we were kind of had good favor with the people of our community. And yet, and yet we were feeling spiritually dry. Uh, we, we were feeling like um, the passion had gone. It felt like more and more that, that we, so pastors included, uh, and our, our leadership team, and the people, it felt more and more like we were attenders. We were attending Sunday morning. We were maybe attending a small group. Um, but somehow the joy of being a follower of Jesus and actually having that be a difference in our lives from day to day, somehow that had kind of seeped away. And this was first identified by our leadership team. So men, women, and some of the, uh, of the congregation and some of the senior staff. And uh, after several months of praying about this kind of, what's going on here? Why do we feel so kind of lethargic in our spirits? The idea of a sacred assembly started to come to us. And there are many places in scripture where there's call to prayer, there's call to lament, there's call you know, to cry out to the Lord. But nowhere uh, in Scripture other than in Joel chapter 1 and 2 do we have a really definitive uh, understanding of what this sacred assembly is all about. The nation of Israel is in a mess. They have wandered far from the Lord. And God is calling them back. And we read in Joel chapter 1. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from your house, from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land of the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And then in verse 16, has not the food been cut off before our very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. And when we read that, we realized a couple of things. The joy and the gladness was gone. And that was, that was naming what we were feeling. <clears throat> and that the weight of the responsibility for addressing this condition really fell on the leaders of the church, to the pastors and to the elders. They were to call a sacred assembly. And then in the second chapter of Joel, we get a little more detail about what a sacred assembly might look like. 
Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Have mercy, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. And when we read, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity, this call to a sacred assembly felt more like an invitation from a God who wanted to restore his relationship with us and not like a vindictive God who was wanting to punish us. It felt more like an invitation. And that's why we called a sacred assembly. And I love that focus on the invitation the yeah. God who's in relationship with each of us calls us to himself. Yeah. Okay, so you decided to call a sacred assembly. So how did you prepare for it to happen? Yeah, so we spent several more months after the, the leadership team decided that this is what we were going to do. We spent several for, um, more months in prayer, in listening, in discerning, and discussing how this might actually happen. There's a ton of prayer that went into this because we, we had never done this before. We, we didn't know how to make this happen. Uh, we communicated a lot to our lay leaders and to all the people who called Chartwell their home. We preached about sacred assembly. We preached from Joel. We preached from other passages. Uh, we talked about how the pastors and the elders were feeling this spiritual lethargy, this, this dryness. And uh, we, we talked about the fact that we seem to be missing that, that joy, that, that, that passion, delight in the Lord. And our hope was that everybody would show up. But even if just the leadership showed up, we were going to do this thing. And so this is kind of, we started to map it out. We were going to shut down programming, all the programming. We had a lot of programs. We were going to shut down all program, programming for an entire week. And then each evening, we were going to gather at 7 o'clock. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We were going to gather at 7 o'clock. And we were going to focus on a time of worship. On a time of listening prayer. Uh, we were going to have a short devotional, not preaching, but a devotional to, um, to humble ourselves before the Lord, to prepare ourselves to listen to what he might have to say to us. And we were going to make sure that we had some prayer people available for anybody who wanted to receive prayer but other than that, we didn't know how this was going to kind of play out. We really didn't have much of an idea of if God was going to show up, how he was going to show up, how things were going to work. The, the time of listening, this kind of reflective listening, ended up being a really crucial part of what we did. And we would spend extended periods of time, 10, 15 minutes, in silence, listening for what God might have to say. And it, it wasn't listening in a vacuum. We were kind of asking questions like, Lord, why are we feeling so spiritually dry? What's that connected to? How come we don't have that joy, that delight? Is there something that we're doing or not doing that we need to address? What are your next steps 
for us in following Jesus. And that's kind of, that's kind of how we, we prepared, how we kind of got ready for this thing. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so good. Okay, so you're prepared. It happened. Tell us what happened. How did the week progress? What ended up happening the first time you guys did this? Yeah, so the first night, to be honest, was a little underwhelming. Um, the leaders were there. Um, the church was maybe 60%, 70% full. The worship was good. Um, the time of listening was good. Uh, people kind of got some words from the Lord and shared those, and there was some good prayer time. Uh, but it was kind of like, eh, it was like it was okay. Um, but there were no kind of lightning bolts from heaven. There was no um, directive that, that, you know, no, nobody was just kind of overwhelmed with anything. It was just kind of okay. Um, people did respond to what they heard, and there was some movement, and we were allowing for, you know, whatever you hear the Lord saying, respond. So some people would come up for prayer, some people would go to other people, for prayer, the, you know, the Lord kind of directed them and said, I, I think I need to get you to pray for me. Or they might be going to a, another person in the congregation and saying, I think I need to apologize to you. And um, could we just pray together? So there was some good stuff happening. At the end of that first evening, we, we debriefed, and, and I recall this general feeling of being just a little disappointed. But each day built on the other. And the worship began to get more vibrant. And our times of silence became more sacred. And um, it was amazing to watch hundreds and hundreds of people sit in silence and wait for God to speak. I'll never forget those moments. Um, as people responded out of the, those seasons of waiting, uh, there was more and more activity. People began to overflow in tears of lament, of sorrow, of regret, of joy. And people were just going back and forth. Uh, they were coming up to pastors and apologizing. Pastors were going to people in the congregation and apologizing. We were praying for each other. Um, others were continuing to worship. Uh, people were just sitting in silence or kneeling or lying down on the floor and just sitting in what God was doing. And as God's Spirit kind of began to fall, uh, during those sacred assembly evenings, word began to filter out and people began to come in droves. So by Wednesday, the church was full. By Thursday, people were standing along the sides, on the back, like hundreds, people on the floor in, in front of the, the pews. Um, and there was this energy, this, this excitement um, and people couldn't wait for the worship to start. You know how sometimes you're, you're, you're at a concert and the team, you know, they're, they're not coming up, the band's not coming up, and people start to clap and cheer, and, and they, they just want to compel them to come. It was kind of like that. It had that kind of energy to it. Some of the most vivid memories uh, for me include those times of silence that I mentioned. Uh, and, and I had the privilege of uh, facilitating some of them. So kind of like here, I'm up front and I'm looking at you and, and your faces are turned up towards the Lord. And there isn't a peep for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes. It's kind of like hardly anybody's even breathing. It was just incredible. Uh, another vivid memory was our children. Like our children started to come, high schools and elementary school, and, and they kind of claimed um, the front pews right over there, and that was their turf. Like, really? Uh, yeah, it was amazing. And then the baptisms. Oh, my goodness. We weren't preaching baptism, but people 
began to repent. People began to come to a new faith in Jesus. People who had been believers felt like they needed to renew their commitment, and they wanted to be baptized. And so we decided on Friday night, that's what we would do. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we're not a big church, but we had 19 baptisms on Friday night, more than we had had in many, many years put together. And there were still people who wanted to be baptized. So the following Sunday, we baptized another seven or eight more. And what can I say? It was a party. <laughs> the joy and the delight was back big time. And then just one more uh, memory. So we, we started at 7 on Monday night, and we had kind of pegged maybe two hours. That should be enough. Mm -hmm. And it certainly was on the Monday night. Uh, by Thursday night, we were into midnight. <laughs> Friday night, we were into 2, 2 a.m. Like, it was nuts. Um, it was just incredible. Uh, one of the most exhausting and exhilarating weeks of my pastoral ministry. Uh, it's so beautiful, right, to hear stories of making space for God to mm. come and show up without much expectation of we don't know, and to just see how he fills the space and the room and the hearts and the lives of those that are engaging in sacred assembly. What a really, yeah. what a really cool marker in your ministry journey, and then to be able to share that I think is, is important and significant for us to hear that. The stories of those that are around us and the ways that they have responded to what God has put before them. So kind of as we wind down, Peter, I would love to know, so then what, what thoughts do you have for us as a church as we're learning about and heading into this idea of sacred? Sacred and solemn assembly, by the way, we've been calling it solemn assembly. It's, it's the same. Uh, the scriptures in Joel do call it sacred assembly. But what words would you have for us as a church? Yeah, there's, there's so much that, that I could say, but I really want to encourage you and commend you for moving in this direction. And as you enter your sacred assembly, whatever that might look like um, here in Oakville and, and in the other sites, uh, come with an open heart and an open mind to receive from Jesus whatever he might have for you. Be expectant. Don't be fearful. Be open. Not filled with excuses why this isn't going to work for you. And if I might be so bold, it's actually not about you. <laughs> and it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And the invitation of Jesus is to bring all of you, all of you, all of your laments and sorrows and shame and regret, all of your hopes and expectations and desire, bring all of you to meet with Jesus and let Jesus do his good work in and through you. Um, I, I, towards the end of last year, I was using um, the, the devotional app, Lectio 365, as a guide through, through Advent. And one of the stories uh, in that, in that uh, guide was about the Apostle Peter and Jesus on the beach. This is after Jesus has been crucified, after Peter has denied him three times, Jesus has been resurrected, and there's this little beach breakfast thing happening. And Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. After a horrible season in Peter's life, where he denies the Savior three times, and then sees the Savior killed, tortured. Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? At the end of an incredibly difficult year for, for you here at the Meeting House, the question is not, was 2022 a good year or a bad year? The question is not, how have I grown or not grown through this challenging year, through these difficult circumstances? The question that Jesus has for you 
is do you love me? And it isn't a test. It's an invitation. Do you love me? And that's at the heart of sacred assembly. It's not about getting more teaching or finding a roadmap for the future. It's not about a strategic plan for recovery from what has been a very challenging time. Sacred assembly is about spending time with Jesus who asks you in the deepest, most profound and sincere way, do you love me? And it's an invitation. It's not a test. Thank you for those words. And I just want us, uh, wherever you're engaging with this teaching, to just take a breath for a moment and sit with that truth. Hmm. Uh, the God of the universe, who has ordered and created everything, says to each of us individually, I'm inviting you into relationship with me. And I'm inviting you into a space of sitting with me and hearing from me, letting me transform you from the inside out and teach you more about what it means to love me. Hmm. And so, Peter, I'm going to ask you to pray for us in a minute, but just as we uh, just want to speak to us as a church community for a minute, as we've said and postured, as we talk and learn about solemn assembly, this is the first year we've collectively done this as a community. I know for so many of us individually, it's relatively normative to sit in prayer with Jesus, to hear from him, to, to listen and respond to what he's saying. But there's something very significant about doing it corporately as a church. And, and we say this first year that in some ways we're sort of just dipping our toes into the waters of solemn assembly. And that's the expressions of how this plays out across each of our locations, across our sites, including our online community, are going to look different. Uh, different locations have different ideas of how we want to engage in solemn assembly through maybe some additional prayer times, through questions at home church. So you're going to want to engage locally and find out what this means for you in our online community. Maybe there'll be some opportunity through our Discord chat or through the online chat to just continually engage co collectively. Also, another resource that we will be providing for you by the end of this month is an individual guide to sit and to practice and to learn more about the the, the steps through solemn assembly and to do that individually too. So our hope is through this month that you're not hearing, hey, across everywhere, we're just going to do this deep dive in all together. We're learning. We're humbly opening ourselves up to what God might have and the expressions of that will look different. But I hope that all of us hear the same words that this is an invitation to go deeper in relationship with God. Another thing I just want to put in front of all of us, as we culminate our solemn assembly month in this time of teaching, I want to put a date in your mind. On February 4th, collectively as a church, we're inviting us to gather together. You would have heard us by now talk about through the fall that we're working on gathering and curating the story of our church. And we've, we've, uh, we have an external consult that's helped us do that. We've done a lot of talking and interviewing with those that have been a part of the church history from, from its inception. And we really sense that this is kind of a next step for us in our journey as a church, in our journey of healing, and in our journey of discerning what might be next. And so there'll be more details coming, but February 4th, we're gathering. Hopefully many of us can come together in person, but if you're too far from our production site in Oakville, it will be available online to sit with the story of our church and make space to celebrate where God's faithfulness has been so evident, to grieve and lament and repent for the things that we need to in our church story, and to open ourselves up to make room for what God might have to say. So that's coming on February 4th. Peter, would you pray for us mm. as we walk out of today and continue in this month of learning around solemn assembly? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, let's pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you for your invitation to come and spend time with you. I pray for your hand of blessing and protection and healing and wholeness and freedom and release that we all individually and collectively might um, learn a little bit more about who you are learn a little bit more about who you've called us to be. And Lord, as you're doing that, 
Would you um, provide spiritual protection, spiritual cover against all that the enemy would seek to do just to mess with us? Help us to receive the fullness of your grace and your goodness. And for anyone, everyone, who needs a little more joy and delight in their life, may we experience the joy and the delight of the risen Savior. In his name we pray, amen. Wow, what a word that was. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing with us. As Peter spoke, I had a picture of um, just like wings coming from the throne of heaven, uh, just wings of love, so large, so wide, that it encompassed all of us. And this, as Peter said, is not a test, but is an invitation. And there's an invitation of God to come and be covered under his wings of love, come into freedom. And so I'm really looking forward to our solemn assembly times as whatever they might look like for us, uh, particularly here on the live stream, I encourage you to... Uh, if you are already a part of a home church, to participate this month with that. And if not, maybe this might be a good time to join one or to gather, gather with a few friends as a huddle and um, just do this together. The materials are going to be provided, so you'll have opportunity to do that together. And we don't want to miss out on what God is doing. So I encourage you to take that next step uh, as we come towards that time of having the solemn assembly. Well, we have a wonderful opportunity now again to just respond to God's invitation even right now, right here, wherever you are, as Peter prayed, um, that God wants to touch each of us and uh, prepare us for what he has for us for this year. And so we're going to go to worship again, uh, musical worship again, and I uh, just in encourage you to open up your hearts and receive this, that God might take you on a journey into places that you never thought you could go and to accomplish things that you never thought you could, but most of all, that you would experience the depth of his love for you. So let's open our hearts as we worship together once again. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we spend the next few minutes just processing our feelings, our thoughts, on this coming year, on this coming season for our church, on our upcoming solemn assembly. And as we do that, I just wanted to, to, um, to talk about our intention. We started this morning about uh, just being intentional with our time, with our thoughts, with this space. And to take that one step further, to be intentional with our body posture. As we come to church, you might see people do all sorts, clap, jump, raise their hands, do a little of this, maybe a little side shuffle. And the Bible is actually very clear to define worship and praise with body postures. Do you know that there are seven Hebrew words that define and describe the word praise and worship in the Bible? And the one that I wanna talk about this morning is the word yada. And the posture that comes with the word yada is this. Hands up, palms out. And there's two meanings to this position. By raising as high as you can go, you are saying, God, I am in total praise. I am in total abandon. I am in total surrender of who I am, of everything that I'm holding. I give everything, everything. It's almost like you are trying to extend as far as you can to Jesus. I'm in total praise, total surrender. But by intentionally having your palms up, you are equally saying, God, I need you. I am in a place to receive what you have for me. Total surrender, total acceptance of what you have. Yada. And so this morning as we sing, I want to encourage you, I welcome you to do this with me. And maybe your comfort level isn't this. Maybe it's this, or here. Or maybe there's some of you that are gonna keep it real close right in front of you. But I encourage you this morning, why don't we do this together wherever your comfort is. 
raise your hands out in yada and say, God, I make room for you. I make room for your spirit. I surrender to you, God, all the preconceived ideas and notions, God, of who you are, of what I expect from you. I surrender to you, God, my fears and my doubts of the unknown, my anxieties, God, my feelings of wariness and weariness, God, I surrender them to you. And God, I am open and ready, God, to receive what it is that you have for me. I believe, Jesus, that you are here this morning, that you are speaking this morning, that you want to move in and through this place in our lives and in our church. So, Jesus, we lift our hands to you. Total praise. Total surrender. So shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. So shake up the ground of all my religion. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Oh, your way is better. So we will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Oh, we will make room for you to do whatever you
Everywhere you go, we will follow Jesus. Would your spirit move within us, Jesus? We need you, God. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk. Take me deeper than my fear In the presence of my Savior Sing it again, Spirit Spirit, lead me where my So I pray that as we go about our week, as we continue to focus on you and make room for you, God, that we would keep in mind to be totally abandoned and total surrender, but also, God, wait in anticipation of what it is that you want to do and say in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Say it with me. Amen. Amen. Wow, well, that song truly encapsulates our prayer. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you, pursuing you all the days of this week and until we meet again. Uh, may God's peace be upon you. See you next week. <laughs>